So are we starting on time, Aaron? We've done an amazing job. Everyone has done an amazing job of being on time. Yes, uh, I completely agree. We would absolutely love to start on time, Aji. So I think as long as we have our panelists here, they could turn on their cameras. I'm here, Aaron. And Wonderful. I've actually prepared a few slides. Great, I'll turn it over to you, Ajay. Uh, for those of you that don't know Ajay, he is a terrific colleague, a program director at NHGRI in the Division of Genomic Medicine. He oversees a number of large um, trans NIH programs, including uh, links and um, has significant involvement in the HubMap program as well. Thanks, Ajay, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was worried that I will have to introduce myself, which is always a bit weird. Um, but we are going to switch now from um, uh, individual long detailed presentations or various keynote vision statements to very brief uh, presentations along with followed up by um, sort of a panel discussion. So please be ready for with all of your questions. So essentially, we have three panelists, uh, Dr. Sarah Teitman, Dr. Lana Gramier, and Dr. Neil Hanchard. Um, they have been asked uh, to speak for five minutes each um, and to address uh, three basic questions. Where do we want to be? Um, what is the aspirational goal? And what are the barriers and opportunities? So as I said, all of, each one of them will get five minutes. And at the end of four, I'll just briefly pop in and give a one minute warning. So first up is uh, Sarah Teichman. Uh, Dr. Sarah Teichman is the head of cellular genetics at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Her research focuses on four complementary study areas, transcription regulation and gene expression, single cell genomics, immunology and protein complexes. Dr. Teichman is co-founder and principal leader of the Human Cell Atlas International Consortium, which aims to create comprehensive reference maps for all human cells to further understand health and disease. Dr. Teichman, do you have slides? If so, well, I have prepared a few actually, yeah, just after listening to the talks earlier. Great, thank you, Ajay. Thanks for inviting me. And it's a real pleasure to be here. And of course, I'm part of the HubMap Consortium, um, which Ajay co-organizes via the NIH Commons Fund. And so I'm somewhat familiar with NIH kind of so certain types of um, modes of, of investment. And um, uh, so it's a real pleasure to speak about um, sort of my feeling about future opportunities. And I just want to put up a few a few bullet points, and then I'll elaborate on why I think that they're they're valuable. So, um, single cell multiomics and electronic health records in a longitudinal manner, I think, will get, gain give insights into disease progressions um, at a very high dimensional, detailed cell and molecular level. And I'll, I'll explain why I think that based on recent COVID research. And then further, you know, we've heard about resources that are genetic sized, UK Biobank um, is the one that I'm most familiar with. And then there's, there's uh, sort of counterparts here in, uh, here in the US, so to speak. Um, and, um, you know, combining these modalities um, with genetic sized cohorts that have, that are genotyped or whole genome sequenced, I think would then allow you to layer on top um, uh, your, your interrogation of the tissue or fluid that you're studying by single cell multiomics with the clinical metadata and the, the genotype data. And, you know, we've, we've, we've heard things along these lines earlier in the earlier talks, and this is really just a more specific kind of um, suggestion. And then, and then looking at disease versus control cohorts, which I'll give an example of in cohort in COVID. So it would be remiss of me um, not to say that as a healthy reference in terms of the cells and molecules in our body, um, I'm obviously partial to the human cell atlas that Ajay has mentioned. Um, you know, men, there, there are some members of the human cell atlas community here, and I invite all of you to join as well if you're, you're interested in the healthy reference map of the human body. And, and um, the technologies that we're using to map 
the, the tissues are single cell genomics, spatial transcriptomics, spatial methods coupled and stitched together by computational methods. And there are, I mean, Thule is right that it's sort of how human cells is not there as it were, it's not ready. Um, there is significant amount of data uh, that's op fully open access in the data coordination platform. And there's a lot of additional data in under managed access. And you can see examples of numbers from major uh, tissues and organs here, the kidney, half a million skin, over a million airways, many millions of cells or nuclei and suspension data, um, uh, gastrointestinal tract, human developmental stages and tissues, of course, many millions because they're so varied, liver, half a million, so on. So these are just a few examples. And computational methods for integrating them into and placing them into space are, are rapidly developing um, using things like cell to location from Oviparactor, where the suspension data is mapped onto the spatial transcriptomic data here for reconstructing tissue architecture at single cell resolution and full transcriptomic breadth. And, and um, I'll skip on to what I, why I think this can be valuable in disease and what I've learned through COVID-19. And that is studying blood, which is one of these tissues in the body that's very accessible and um, you know, like urine or saliva or other things that have been mentioned or you know, potentially also biopsies. We got together with three centers in the UK and uh, didn't have much longitudinal data, but we're capturing uh, COVID patients of different disease severity, the asymptomatic mild, moderate, severe and critical. And basically this allowed us to define cell types and gene expression signatures at a lot of detail and resolution and define different cell and molecular signatures of, of the different cohorts. Now, these are not longitudinal, as I said, they're kind of snapshot captured. This wasn't an eight year project like Mike's, it was a, a you know, few month project. And um, what I realized was that in the UK, many of these are collected under so-called bioresource ethics where you can go in you can apply and you can go into the electronic health records. And so this is, this cohort is, 140 patients in total. Sorry, uh, this cohort was 140 patients in total. They're all SNP chipped. They all have electronic health records. And basically we were only scratching the surface in this nature medicine paper that we published a few months ago. And there is, it's such an exciting time. I think there's such rich data for coupling different modalities at the genetics level, at the multi-omics level. This is site seq. So you've got protein, you've got RNA, you've got VDJ sequencing. You've got electronic health records. There's huge potential here. So I'll leave you with this slide again um, about what I think is the future of sort of medical functional genomics, essentially, where you're not just looking at a healthy reference state in the biology, but you're also wanting to go into disease. Thank you. Now we'll stop thanks, there. Thanks, Dr. Peckman. Um, Dr. Garmier. So Dr. Garmier is Associate Professor of the Department of uh, in the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics at the University of Michigan. She leads a multidisciplinary team engaged in computational and experimental human genomics works on translational bioinformatics. Her research interests are single cell sequencing in bioinformatics and integration of omics and clinical data and high throughput methods to study non-coding RNA. Dr. Gardner. Hi, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. It's a great pleasure to be in this workshop and learn from the colleagues about the most recent uh, uh, technologies, assays, and ideas, as well as helping uh, planning um, um, for the next phase uh, together for NHGRI's uh, uh, mission plans. Um, as I was introduced that my group is really a computational group. We, uh, we focus on uh, translational bioinformatics. In fact, uh, when I started my research group from University of Hawaii, about eight, nine years ago, we started with multi-omics integration as the overarching goal. And now after eight, nine years, our overarching goal is still multi-omics data integration, but we um, updated somewhat to include uh, um, more than multi-omics, uh, also other modality of the data as well in our research. So uh, in a lab, just for those who are not very familiar with me, we do multi-model uh, patient survival prediction um, supported by one R1. Uh, we also do a lot of integration work at a single cell resolution, developing bioinformatic tools. Uh, we also, you know, uh, think about uh, uh, forwardly how we can use the genomic models to make them actionable and the develop drug reposition um, pipelines and methods computationally. And lastly, I also have a personal and a professional interest to pregnancy adversities. I have another R1 founded to study preeclampsia, multi-omics based preeclampsia biomarker study. 
So as you can see, you know, uh, really uh, our research is very centralized, centralized around model omics model, model data integration. Uh, so from the data science perspective, I can tell you that currently there are a lot of methods out there uh, that uh, you know, claim to do data integration. But if you examine them very carefully, you realize that the most of these methods, they're not supervised by phenotypes. Rather, they start from bottom up by integrating different kinds of genomic data. And then try to uh, identify the patterns within the uh, coherent patterns within different uh, uh, genomic data. For example, this A is a kernel-based method, and B down the, uh, at the bottom is the neural network-based method, and C here is correlation-based method, and D here is the is a mathematical framework called a matrix factorization method. All those methods they have one thing that is in common that is unsupervised, starting from from uh, from the uh, heuristic of of the genomics data. So it comes to me that there's something lacking, which is why can't we use use a phenotype as part of the uh, the rules to uh, to uh, help decide uh, what the outcome of the prediction could be. So because uh, due to that consideration, our contribution to the community is to develop. Um, um, several versions of uh, deep, deep learning based method we call the DeepProg. It is a multi omics data integration framework supervised by survival. In this, uh, we use survival as a phenotype. So, without going into the, a great amount of detail, uh, this method draws on uh, in some way approach where you take different genomics data as an input, you do a, a bunch of pre-processing, and for each genomic data type, you use autoencoders, you reduce the dimensions of, of, of the input features, and then you link those, uh, transform the hidden layer features with survival, with the survival features to define them as new survival features, informative survival features, and after that, we do clustering approach identify optimum number of clusters in your cohort, and then, then you build a classification algorithm. And then because it's a, a supervised method, it can be applied to predict many other cohorts across the various types of uh, genomics data types. Um, so this is a framework of, of, of this methodology. We tested initially uh, on uh, liver cancer. So we built the model using TCGA and uh, we applied it for uh, on top of a variety of other uh, population cohorts, uh, very heterogeneous uh, populations from various uh, ethnicities across different uh, uh, omics uh, measurements, uh, either in uh, RNA seq or microRNA or DM methylation, etc. So here the result shows that this model is really robust uh, across all the populations, all the cohorts, all the genomic uh, genomic uh, uh, measurements. More than that, we also expanded this framework to predict the 32 types of TCG cancers to stratify, you know, how many patient uh, survival uh, subgroups are there can we identify? And turns out most of the cancers can be optimized into two survival risk groups. So this is, uh, we are hoping that uh, this work is going to be useful for the clinicians in order to provide a first line uh, uh, reference for them to, to predict, you know, what their patient survival status could be. This work is supposed to be accepted by genome medicine soon. Um, so that's one example of what we what we have done, you know, from the computational aspect. Um, overall, from my perspective, I think as data scientists working in this field uh, over many years, uh, here are some bullet points I would like to address uh, in terms of challenges in data integration. One of the challenges, uh, you know, uh, there is very co complex confounders people may actually not even be aware of or, uh, or take them into account. One is actually totally uh, talked about earlier. One is the cell type and the tissue type heterogeneity. So to do that, you know, you need to use deconvolution methods, but however, during the process of doing deconvolution, we find that you know those methods are not reliable. The reference data sets are not really great, so it's a whole line, another box of, of worms that we opened up recently. And I'll show you a slide uh, at the very end about this issue. And then another issue is some other confounders that need to be addressed in the study, big study design. For example, you know some phenotypes, uh, age, ethnicity, and treatment, etc. Especially for TCGA data set, we worked a, a tremendous amount. The treatment uh, um, 
options are really, really limited. So it really limits how powerful we could use this kind of public repository to do uh, new discoveries and uh, treatment suggestions, et cetera, this prediction, et cetera. And also from the data uh, science perspective, uh, there have been a lot of a lot of you know, methods claim to be the best um, in their own view. However, there really isn't enough um, unbiased benchmark studies that are very active. And I think this field, uh, this, this field of benchmarking really deserves a lot of more uh, uh, attention. And one issue is the next slide I will tell you. Uh, also, like many other people already mentioned about, you know, the next challenge is uh, how do you integrate the different types of omics data with other data modalities, for example, image data and electronic health record data. And um, uh, further, how, how would you integrate the different scales of data from the single cell resolution to uh, bulk resolution to the population uh, resolution? So these are all challenges and at the same time presenting themselves as opportunities for us all. So Thank here's the, the issues that we have right now. You know, uh, I study percent. Do I have time? No, actually. No. All right. Uh, so do you want a few seconds to summarize? Yes, I just have a few seconds to, to, to illustrate the, the problem is really non-trivial. Here, you know, you start with a placenta a cohort from my collaborator, over 300 samples, and then they are acid into, uh, you know, gene expression RNA-seq versus gene methylation. And so because the availability of the two types of assays, we use two different approaches to try to decumulate the data. One is to use Sarah's data published from 2018 Nature paper on placenta. And we use that, that reference data set and decomposed the cell type, major cell types in placenta. And this is the distribution of different cell, cell types in, in, in using RNA-seq data. However, if you use another reference data set that claim to be cell-specific DM methylation markers, you get a very different picture of the cell proportions. And which one is true, which one is, is, is false? Uh, I don't have a confirmative answer for that, but I do think there's uh, there's some limitation in terms of the you know bulk level cell type specific DNA methylation markers. Uh, we tend to think that single cell RNA data based reference is better. Uh, we also have some you know uh, uh, private data from placenta in our own lab that matches pretty well with Sarah's papers cell type proportions. Uh, with that, I just end with end my Thank brief discussion of, uh, about the challenges that we're faced. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next uh, presenter is Dr. Neil Hanchard. Dr. Hanchard is a clinical investigator within the medical genomics and metabol metabolic genetics branch at NHGRI Division of Intermural Research. His research interests lie in the use of genomic and genetic tools to understand complex pediatric diseases and traits in diverse populations. Dr. Hanchard aims to understand the molecular mechanisms that lead to disease and to catalog related genes, biological pathways, and mechanisms. Dr. Hanscher, thank you for starting to share already. Thanks, Ajay. So, um, so, so thank you for the opportunity to sort of share this, you know, realizing that you're the last speaker at the end, and the big question is where do we want to be? That's kind of a fraught kind of question to, to ask. Um, but I thought that the talks have been so good and stimulating today that there's actually some, some uh, good data that can come from this. So I'm coming at this from a sort of physician, scientist, clinician, translational research type of uh, viewpoint. And so I started looking from this review I read many years ago, where the sort of omics are represented as two-dimensional um, ent entities that sort of give rise to a three-dimensional you know, body at the end. And I thought that was really useful. And of course, it could be updated nowadays with additional omics and sort of environment and diet and EHR and all the other things that we've heard about today. Um, and in the ideal world, again, you'd have that available for all clinical states, right? So whether that's health or disease, you've got this sort of multiplanar um, viewpoint of, of each one of these. And in the ideal world, you would have this available for differing disease states, different ages, and different ancestries. Um, and so from where we are now, obviously there's a lot of, um, there's, there's the issue of how that would work as a reference if you, know, you have to harmonize the data and then there are governance issues. Um, but I thought about it also in terms of going forward from, from where we are now, in terms of the three areas that we've kind of discussed um, a bit more today. 
So like from a data integration standpoint, you know, the, the real problem, and I'm not a statistician, but even I can see that there are, you know, unique challenges to integrating this kind of high dimensional, um, large data sets over, over multi planes, right? And so this becomes a, an issue about how you can use hypothesis, how you can use this kind of data for generating a hypothesis for identifying a biomarker or patterns of biomarkers that can be utilized um, to understand sort of health and disease states. But on the other hand, there are potentially sort of lower hanging fruit that relate to sort of going from the uh, those kind of relationships that we know very well right now, those of genotype, phenotype, or, or transcriptomic phenotype type of relationships, and using this kind of data in order to trace the causal um, pathways and sort of understand more about the disease mechanism, which is something that can be intervened with. Um, from a technology standpoint, again, so that I'm a physician scientist, I'm, I'm often collecting cohorts of children in far from parts of the world. And so one of the real limitations to this is sort of being able to assay all of these from a single sort of aliquot of sample. Um, so obviously in the single cell world, this is moving towards where we're getting to, we're able to assay multiple layers of, of omics from, from a given sort of sample. Um, but you could even think about it as one step above as you sort of collect these cohorts. You know, it's really helpful if you can collect one sample from an individual that will cover everything rather than one sample for RNA, one sample for DNA, one sample for metabolomics. And when you're dealing with um, like kids, for instance, where you have a limitation in the amount of sample that you can take, then this becomes, you know, particularly, um, this comes particularly to the fore. But I think all of these things relate to this idea about study design and, and what we've heard today, really talking about the utility of, of having longitudinal stu study designs um, to be able to understand temporal, intra-individual or, or intra-disease intra variability and being able to utilize those insights to understand um, trajectories and build new biomarkers and understand um, even thinking of time points as sort of pre-intervention, post-intervention, sort of understanding the utility of it. I think the problem here, of course, is one of cost, right? So, you know, do you do you have enough? You, can you collect all of these? So it costs a certain amount of money to recruit one individual and do all of these studies on one individual. You sort of multiply that by doing multiple time points, and you multiply multiple time points by a cohort of individuals. It gets expensive, um, but I do think that some of the advantages in technology. Um, will sort of heavily inform this, like if we can get down to single sampling or again with data integration where you might be able to, you know, identify those particular modalities that will be most useful for your particular study question so that you're uh, again, be able to use imputation where it needs to be utilized um, in order to sort of make the whole effort a little bit more um, tractable. Um, and that's really all I had and I'm certainly open for discussion at this point. Thank you, Dr. Hanchard. So you, you made up for time. Uh, great, so um, we are now open for um, uh, a set of discussions and questions to the, to the panelists. Uh, I see that there are a few questions to, in, the, in the chat. Uh, does anybody, okay, there's Rachel. Rachel, your hand is raised, go for it. Um, we can't hear you, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I was wondering what the panelists thought about, you know, given what we know about the limitations of many of these omics technologies, and I work in the field of metabolomics, so I'm particularly thinking of that, and that we really don't have anywhere near the full coverage of the metabolome. There's a huge amount of missing information. Um, there's a lot that we just don't know about the metabolome, and I, I think the same can be said for many of the other omics. Do you think it's more important to try and perfect each individual omic first before we try and integrate them? Um, or is it even possible to do that? I think, you know, with the metabolome, we're, we're a long way away from being able to capture the whole metabolome, but how far can we go with integration before we fully understand each individual omic? Um, if I may, Rachel, hi, this is Alana. I actually work on metabolomics space quite extensively. So I, th I think I can, you know, share with you my, my, my thoughts. Uh, metabolomics data actually, you know, it's most uh, close to the phenotype data. So depending on the purpose of, uh, of your study, if it's a full biomarker, I would say, you know, metabolomic data are the greatest uh, <laughs> measurements 
for biomarker candidates. Uh, in terms of data integration, um, if you look at the correlation, yes, there might be some issues, you know, integrating metronomic data with other data types. But I think, you know, you could get around with that. If, if, your, if your purpose is for diagnosis prediction, you could definitely use platform, for example, deep learning or some other, just even like renormalize all of the input features by scanning them to be uniform and then stack them together and try to do prediction. Uh, you can definitely do that. However, in terms of understanding the mechanism, biological mechanism, that's a different story. Uh, you know, for metabolomics, because you really don't have to get a lot of measurements, you really need missing out on a lot of things. You only see the tip of the iceberg. Um, but the hope is that, uh, you know, by looking at other genomics, uh, like a transcriptomics, uh, they, it can give you some trace mark of you know where the things are happening, right? The enzymes that are converts metabolite one to another. If there's consistency, then it shows some sort of a, a trend. You could do some heuristic thing that, that way. Yeah, I I I I agree that you know you, you do have the potential from where you are now that with integrating, depending upon what your question is, right? So if you're sort of interested in patterns or biomarkers, then you probably have a resolution where if you combine that with the other omics, you'll get what you want. But if, you're, if your goal is really to understand the sort of deep detail of a particular metabolic pathway um, in a particular disease, then you might be a little bit more stuck where you need to spend more energy sort of understanding what this is exactly like. So, you know, it, where you are now is highly useful for me, for instance, but maybe somewhat less useful for somebody who's sort of targeting a specific drug pathway, for instance. I think those are great answers. Don't think I need to add anything. Thank you. So there is a there's a question in the chat about um, about how to create benchmarks, and I think it was also there in. Lana slides, and I think Joe Ecker expanded uh, a bit to include both experimental and computational methods and, and benchmarking these. Um, what are people's thoughts on, on benchmarks? I mean, it's the sort of task that you know, no one wants to take up. I, I somewhat disagree, you know, actually, having been on a lot of you know, experimental and computational benchmarking papers over the decades, they, are, they end up being extremely highly cited. And, and the, cell, the cell atlas community as, a, you know, as the standards and technology working group has done a few of them. And the community is incredibly grateful for that kind of work. So it's, I think the challenge is, is you know, it's a lot of work and effort to implement other people's methods, either computationally or experimentally. So it can be tough to do that, but it's, it's, it is very worthwhile. And it's, you know, one of the challenges is having a gold standard then or a reference data set and so on. But um, definitely I think that type of work is, is really, really valuable. Yeah, I so think- Judy has a question in the chat also. Yeah, in fact, this is really an area that I, I'm starting to pay attention to because I meet, I have this kind of problem myself as a computation biologist. You know, we run different methods, computational decomposition methods to get the different, vastly different results. For example, to say different cancer types. And so, you know, it came to this question, okay, are those reference data are good enough? You know, the, those data were measured under certain context, you know, microenvironment. Does it really apply to you know other scenarios, other 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 RNA-seq data? I don't know. I don't. I, I think it needs to have uh, tissue specificity, tissue specificity or cell type specificity. Uh, so my feeling is that it needs some updating in terms of the reference data. In terms of computational methods themselves, there are you know various methods developed dealing with different omic space, RNA-seq, demethylation and now from single sari data to bulk RNA data, et cetera. So this area of research uh, is very much, you know, underappreciated by folks in the computational biology domain because some of the people just don't think it's novel. It's, it's, it's like you're trying to be a policeman, right? And you oftentimes getting criticized. You evaluate one, one method performs better than the other method, et cetera. So, uh, 
it's a hard work to do that. Like Sarah said, you have to understand the method good enough in order to make a really fair comparison. So I feel like this is falling into the engineering domain. You know, you need to have the data, the benchmark data, the comprehensive benchmark data. You need to collect the methods. The method needs to be well documented, easy to be downloaded and run. And then you need to have the good uh, uh, metrics to evaluate them systematically without a bias. So all of those are engineering concepts and uh, engineering concepts and people don't necessarily appreciate that. So, you know, I'm trying to use this voice to raise awareness in the community. And hopefully, you know, the funding agency can help support the research in this area. It is actually research. Okay, thanks. I think there are a whole bunch of hands up. Howard had his hand up first, I believe. And people are sending me direct messages about having questions. So um, let us let me do an order, Howard, Lindsay, and Tiago. Uh, thanks, AJ. This is a question for everybody. And so we've heard about these uh, various study designs, very ambitious, very careful, for collecting multiple data modalities. And my question is what happens when you actually have, let's say gaps in the data? How are the methods, current methods in dealing with that? Imagine that you started and then some individuals are missing certain data types they're missing some time points. And then in this kind of multi-omic framework, are you always limited always by your weakest link? Because if that were the case, right? As soon as you have one gap, then you can't use that in sample. You cannot use that patient. Then this makes the study design very challenging and also very expensive because everything has to be perfect. What, what are basically ways of dealing with uh, sort of data imputation, uh, ways of addressing this kind of an issue? Maybe is this an area of challenge? Can you uh, speak about that? And the, the way I was thinking about that was more on the EHR side rather than on the the multiomics, you know, on the trinomics side. But but yeah, they could equally apply to the trinomics side. Um, and I think that the it sort of comes out in the wash in terms of imputation if the numbers are large enough, right? Then 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 you can kind of smooth over missing values. Um, and, and that's why one of the things that I emphasized was for this type of disease research, you know, because of this challenge that you're mentioning, Howard, but then also because of simple inter, inter individual kind of variability and so on, just numbers are important. Numbers are going to be important. You know, it's different from sort of healthy reference cell atlasing kind of work. Yeah, I, I agree. I also think that, you know, we can't allow perfection to be the enemy of good, right, or good enough in the sense that um, you know, if, you, if, you have, if you have you know, multiple modalities on, on multiple individuals and you can get through that numbers issue, then as Sarah intimated, you can sort of make a good guess. If you have, and if, that, if the remaining data that you have is rich enough, right? So if everybody's missing five or the eight, then that's kind of problematic. But if you've got sort of a missing hole, single missing hole in each person, then that's something that you can kind of smooth over and be able to understand, particularly as the data sets get larger, you begin to understand what sort of goes with what in a certain sense. Right. I think this speaks to the point that Neil, you're making about the cost, like you're, okay, multiple modalities, multiple time points, multiple people, if we actually can then deal with data gaps, maybe then for certain modalities, we collect every other time of other things, right? We have certain, we, we have much, we have a lot more degrees of freedom in what we need to do, and therefore we can sample more people uh, or, or more time points. So Howard, as far as I know, there are some statistical methods like group factor analysis that you can utilize um, under when, when you have large chunks of data not being available for certain subsets of your sample. I, I don't know in practice how well they, they perform, but they claim to be able to do handle these sorts of things. Yeah, I think the hard part is the dimensionality, right? So you can sort of, you can impute genome data, but you also have to, you know, if you're imputing, you know, transcription data, you also have to take into consideration that you have methylation data that can help with that, or you have genome data that can help to fill in the gaps there. Mm -hmm. So I think the dimensionality in, in some senses might actually work in your favor if you have enough of each. Um. So we are actually doing exactly what Howard is talking about or some of the you know, samples that we have. 
there is no RNA-seq seq data available at all. Completely missing. That is an extreme case. You only have the investigation. You need to impute a complete uh, all the populations, all the all, all, everybody's uh, 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 RNA seq data. What you're gonna do? You know, you just have to deal with it based on what what data available. You can try to use as a training data set and try to build a model. And then hopefully you, the model is good enough to be able to capture the variation within the population. But the, Really, the best way to do it is to de design the study ahead of time well enough. You prepare that, you know, there could be fall, there, there could be problem down the road and have extra well of samples. So if once assay fail, you can you can get more measurements. Um, it, it is really, um, you know, that, that come up with a with small amount of missing data, you can impute there are computational methods handling that. But if it's a whole, you know, entire population, how are you going to impute? The, that's a, that's a grand challenge. <laughs> okay, uh, next question, Lindsay. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was thinking kind of in the study design space about comments that Nancy and Thule and other people have brought up about how to get around, um, I guess, more correlation between data types. So Nancy had mentioned, you know, if you've got a, a vast EMR database and you can see that this, these sets of patients, while they don't have genetic data, there's a similar cohort of patients with genetic data and you can kind of infer that they may, they may have a similar uh, underlying genetic cause. And then Thule's comments about, you know, how we've got a lot of correlation in EQLs uh, between tissues and that, that drills down to, to cell type uh, commonalities between these tissues. And then I, there was another comment about there seems to be more sharingness among molecular phenotypes than there is at the genetic level. And this can kind of compensate for lack of, um, I, I guess, genetic diversity in a lot of studies that have been done. And, and you can kind of look at these molecular phenotypes across populations and get at the root cause of disease. I'm, try, I'm trying to think, this is really just kind of a broader question is, are there ways that we can combine these, these thoughts and these correlations and these sharing this models and say, you know, if we collect these kinds of data and this kind of information, this is the core set that can kind of transcend some of the limitations of the broader genetic studies that we're having where we're lacking population information and we're lacking, you know, potentially the genetic information, but we have, you know, RNA seq or something else. I, it's just kind of a broader thought process of really drilling down to which modalities will give us the biggest bang for our buck in a larger cohort of any given disease. And so I just kind of wanted to bring that up because I saw a thread throughout some of the talks today about that. And I just wanted to bring that up for discussion. Yeah, I, I agree. That's kind of what I was alluding to. I think if you on the sort of data integration side can understand which things give you the best bang for the buck then you can design your, at least for the study that you're interested in. If you, you know, it's gonna be different if you're looking for biomarkers, whether it's you're looking for disease mechanisms, et cetera. But if you can start to understand, you know, which modalities are the most useful in that, then you can design the study up front to say, well, at least we need to get these things, or if you can't get this, then you need to get this. Um, and those things might help with, as I said, bringing the cost down to something that's manageable, but also it'll help ultimately with bringing the statistics into, you know, something where you can be more robust. Yeah, and I guess the more discrete question is, are we, are we there? Do we have enough information where we can make those determinations for some, some diseases or some data sets of interest? Or is that a gap that still needs to be filled um, in certain ways and, and just suggestions on how to do that? I think it's a gap, but I figure I'm not enough of a statistician or computational person to really say whether or not it is or how, how much of a gap it is. But it seems to me that that um, we are, if we're there, it's not like obvious to everybody. Um, um, but if we, but, so it, it might be that we are there, that the data is there, it just hasn't been put together in order to do this kind of effort. Um, and I'm not sure which one of those is gonna end up being true. Okay, so I think, I think Lindsay, you probably hit on a hard question that nobody has anything <laughs> profound to, to, to impart at this point. Um, so let's move along. Um, I think it's Tiago, Tiago, you, you still have a question? 
Yeah, hi, hello. Um, so I was wondering if the panelists could comment on the relative contribution of, uh, so basically different aspects to data integration, namely, um, I see this routinely in a lot of papers that people struggle, struggle to explain the functional links between discordant data sets between, you know, we, we assume that, for example, data methylation will lead to gene silencing, but that doesn't always the case. That's not always the case. You assume that RNA is going to be translated into proteins. That's not always the case. So I'm wondering if there is one aspect about data integration, which is that we, we still don't fully understand from a mechanistic perspective what is the relationship between different types of data. That's one question. Another, or one aspect, another aspect is the sort of static component that we've already talked about. Like, so do we need like really uh, tight time courses? Do we need a lot more longitudinal data to really understand the dynamics, direct, the directionality between uh, the, uh, you know, the relationship between these data sets? Or, you know, are those two things, for example, are actually just a minor aspect and truly the major uh, gap is that we just don't have uh, computational tools that are refined enough to really infer what is meaningful about these data sets. So do we need, you know, more, more sophisticated machine learning uh, tools? So I was wondering if you could comment on basically uh, different aspects that contribute to the, the, the challenge that is data integration. So uh, I, I can comment on that. In, in fact, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the, most of the population measurements are static, it's one snapshot, that really is a problem. Or I, I think it, it contributed to a large part of the problem you see a lack of correlation in the different omic space. <laughs> um, if you assume things are static, uh, uh, in steady state, uh, then the correlation could be, that assumption could be held more or less. However, we know that uh, that's not always the case, right? So, in fact, um, you know, there's a recent work uh, from Fabian's group. Uh, um, they applied uh, uh, um, now steady state assumptions to single cell RNA seq data. They, they improved the RNA velocity algorithm better, they resolved some of the issues of backflows in the, in the RNA seq data set. So, I really I do think that is the direction to go, given that if you can have the you know, um, time series measurements. Let, let me ask. Sorry. But genetics is the other thing, yeah. So time series genetics, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with, with both of those. I think there's probably a gap on both sides, right? I think there's a gap in terms of how we, you know, in terms of being able to actually gauge what we can get from the, the current data sets. But I think there's also a gap in that we don't always have enough longitudinal data. Um, and the, the times where we have gotten longitudinal data, we've learned a lot more. So it seemed to me that we've probably got a gap on both sides, like computationally to be able to make the most of these sort of cross-sectional single point things, but also you know, to really understand that kind of variation of it, the temporal variation, which is, which is to me is a kind of a, almost a completely different ball game. The, the tools may be the same, but I think it gives you a, a, a different insight to the biology. AJ, you're muted. Thank you. Um, we, we, we have two more or less than a minute left now. Um, I'm going to pick a question from, from the chat, Thule's question. So this is extending Tess's question and also to Sarah, re-HCA's work. What are some of the bottlenecks and solutions in more comprehensive multi-omic studies in a global context, both regarding sampling and developing capabilities to do omics assays and data analysis outside the Western world. Yeah, I was sorry. I'd started to type a response to that in the chat, so I didn't have to delete all of that. Um, so I think that the, the there there is a challenge to some extent in sort of selling the utility of doing a lot of this work when you have. Um, because you also have to sell the idea that we want to sample people multiple times on multiple occasions, and you want to be able to um, take multiple samples from each person at each one of those occasions. And sometimes that's a that's a tough sell in terms of what you are going to be able to, you know, sort of 
return on investment for 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 some groups. I also think there's a sort of governance issue, which is probably largely around education, because the same thing happened with the, the genomic data that was generated is sort of how is this going to be used and will this have some benefit to us and you know are there is there going to be loss of information and privacy etc so I, I do think there are governance issues that have come up as we have started to do this at least in h3 africa we've started to to do this but then there's also a little bit of salesmanship left to be done to sort of convince people that there's some utility in having these multiple modalities um, to be to be done on each individual so i think they're surmountable but you know i also think that there are large collections that are going ahead that are very unidimensional. Okay. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, Neil, Lana, and Sarah um, in reverse order from the speaking thing for an excellent um, breakout sort of session here. Um, discussing some of where we could go and um, what sort of challenges still remain out there. There's also an excellent um, uh, set of questions and discussions in the chat. Which, um, you can you can actually save the chat if you if you want. Um, we'll read it afterwards. And with that, I think um, I'll bring this session to an end and hand the microphone back to Erin and uh, Joanella. I think. Judy, um, Ajay, thank you. We, we, at this point, we'll turn it over to our co-chairs, uh, Judy and Howard, to provide a, a quick summary of today, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Very well. Thank you, everyone, for a very stimulating day. Uh, just to briefly sort of uh, refresh, we've heard uh, quite a bit about the vision for NHGRI, the current portfolio, the really growing area of investigation to multi-omics, and then really some of the exciting work that's possible, and also then some of the challenges uh, sort of really in scaling up uh, this area. And some of the kind of recurrent themes I've heard about, really, I think, including a scale and also the kind of diversity of projects that can be done using these new technologies. Uh, Judy, what, what do you want to add, add anything to that? Yeah, no, um, I think the charge we got from NHGRI um, is there's a lot of great work going on that we've heard about. Um, and what are the specific recommendations for NHGRI in terms of staying at the forefront? Um, it's obvious there's data explosion. I actually think Neil Hancher gave a, a, a ter terrific summary uh, of the kind of the triangulation of the three different things, the layers and so forth. But I would go back to the keynote talks uh, from Nancy Cox and Mike Snyder, a lot of common themes. And you know, Nancy's charge, I think, is extremely well taken, which is we've done a lot of great research, substantial advances, and that's the excitement of doing research, but in terms of clinical implementation, that's slow. And I think that we're all feeling kind of that tension between the advances in research and what you can actually implement. Um, the value of passive data collection that you get through the electronic health records or the uh, wearables um, are amazing. Um, as a community, we have to make sure that that doesn't actually worsen uh, health disparities. Um, you can easily see how that might be the case. Uh, the older I get, the more interested I am in aging questions. So we had a couple of very nice references uh, to aging. Um, and one of the kind of, the, the kind of, there was a couple of dichotomies from the keynotes of really comparing the N equals one studies versus population-based references rare variants versus common variants. Um, and um, I think there was, a, there was multiple speakers talked about kind of the, what's rate limiting. And, you know, it, a lot of it is, it's, it's interesting. We've kind of solved the genetics part of it, um, but then the phenotype part, I think is, um, I, think, I think we all agree that, you know, how do you track disease at the earliest stages such that you're really going from that, that transition point of health and disease. Um, and then we've had a very nice discussion about what are we missing right now? Um, and so that's kind of what I got from this. Um, any other comments that we wanna make or those are my major kind of cross-cutting themes. 
Well, thank you, Judy. Yeah, so with that, uh, I think maybe we can bring today's uh, meeting to a close. I just want to remind everybody that the meeting continues tomorrow and there'll be many more uh, discussions. And perhaps tomorrow we can, we can be a little bit more directive and think about what specific recommendations we might want to make. And I see Aaron also has a, a comment. Yeah, thanks, Howard. I think um, before we sign off, I did want to just come back to what I mentioned uh, at the beginning about uh, Juneteenth being um, being uh, commemorated as a, a federal holiday. I just want to quickly share my screen and put up a slide if that's okay with everyone. So um, here we go. Can you see that? Okay, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, we you know, were really excited to hear that um, President Biden is uh, creating this federal holiday to celebrate and commemorate Juneteenth. We were expecting to hear a little bit more from uh, the Office of Personnel Management and HHS and NIH leadership throughout the day, uh, but we quite haven't received that information yet. So, I did just wanna let everyone know, especially our um, colleagues that are federal employees that we do plan to have the workshop tomorrow, but we completely understand if any of you feel like you'd rather um, use your day tomorrow reflecting and celebrating this holiday. I did put up on the screen a campaign uh, with a hashtag move for equity, uh, which is being celebrated uh, at the NIH um, in collaboration with eight changes for racial equity. So if you have a chance, you can check that out as well. Um, but I did just wanna put this out there. Um, if we hear anything more, we will reach out to you throughout the evening, but uh, otherwise we're really looking forward to tomorrow. Um, this has been incredibly uh, productive and insightful day. Um, Joe and Nella, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we sign off? Thanks, Aaron. No, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining. It's been a very stimulating discussion, and I am very much looking forward to tomorrow. See you tomorrow at one o'clock. Thank you very much.